Road to Statehood, and from Constitution to Constitution, 1792 to 1799. The picture you're looking at is one of the most famous paintings. It shows Daniel Boone leading a group of settlers into Kentucky through the Cumberland Gap, which is the way most of them did come in the 1770s. They came from Virginia and Pennsylvania and North Carolina. The Cumberland Gap was narrow. Uh, you couldn't get a wheeled vehicle through. You, as you can see, you're doing good to have three people stand abreast there. And this was pretty much the way it really was. It was very dangerous because it was curvy. And in, around any curve, you could find a group of Indians or even white outlaws. It was also muddy because it didn't get much sun. The deep curves caused you problems every time you turned around. Of course, if you didn't want to come to the Cumberland Gap, you could come down the Ohio River if you were in Pennsylvania on a keel boat or a flat boat. And I think your text gives you a description of both, uh, how they were guided and how they were difficult to handle and slow. Very, very slow. And that river, although Ohio looks kind of peaceful, underneath there's a lot of dangerous currents. There's also danger with material floating in the water like uh, trash and stumps. And by moving so slow, you were a target from Indians at the bank. They could shoot at you from the bank. And of course, on low tides, you could hang up. The only good thing about using a boat to come down the river, it was, and it was down the river since it was all manpower. We didn't have steam yet. Once you got to Kentucky or wherever where you were going, you could use the material in the boat to build you a shelter. In 1772, we had been known as Spencastle County, part of Virginia. In 76, of course, George Rogers Clark talked to the governor and got us to make us a honey on our own. We were in then Kentucky County, and Ken Virginia was claiming us. But by the end of the year, they'd split Kentucky County into three counties. We were Kentucky, Montgomery, and Washington. And within less than six years, those, six count those three counties became nine. So when we did become a state, we were nine counties. And the lawyers are arriving right and left. We're known as a lawyer's paradise because there's so many suits over land. Uh, primarily bad surveying because anybody could go out and try to survey and claim it. And, and a lot of times you would say, my property goes from this tree to that creek to that rock. But what happens if there's a flood or there's an earthquake or something that changes? You have overlapping claims. You have bad surveying. You have people claiming the same land. But basically, there were three types of land. There were the military claims, which would you would be paid for working in the Revolution or the French and Indian War or whatever, through a piece of paper by the, at that point, colony of Virginia, and later on, it would be the state of Virginia. Or you could purchase a land claim, like if you purchased land from the Transylvania Company. They did decide to recognize those, even though they declared his purchase null and void. Or a squatter. In other words, if you went out there and you built a building and you planted a corn crop, even if you didn't have a land claim from Transylvania Company or you hadn't done the military, you could actually claim the land. So military, purchased, and squatters were the three types of land claims. But just getting the claim wasn't necessary. You, you had to have four steps to claim this land. You had to obtain a warrant, either military, purchase, or be granted one because you were a squatter. Then you had to go to the county seat and file it with the county, you know, these are my dimensions of my land. Then you would have the county surveyor come out and actually do the survey and then file the claim in Richmond. Now let's face facts, folks. Richmond is over the mountains. It's a long way to go. But in 1779, right before we became a state, uh, Virginia passed a land act, which you could get 400 acres for $2.25 per 100 acres. So for $9, you could get 400 acres of land which sounds cheap to us, but you've got to consider that money was in short supply out there in those days. And you had land speculators snapping up the claims. They would not buy them in the land company's name. They would have their cousin or their brother or a friend buy them. So by 1792, when we became a state, with the, all the people that were out here, there was about 70,000 at this point in time, two-thirds of the adult white males did not, I repeat, did not own land. And as you can see, land was cheap, it was available, uh, it should have been easy to get. But Boone lost land, Clark lost land, Clinton, uh, not Clinton, but uh, Kenton lost land, because they didn't follow all four steps. They might get a survey, but they would not get it filed with the land company, or they'd have overlapping land claims. 
So two-thirds of the adult male population in 1792 when we became a state did not own land. So why did we want to separate? Well, we were getting kind of irritated because Virginia didn't pay any attention at all to the Indian problems. And then they came up with that rule that we could not take the offensive against the Indians. I mean, they could come across the Ohio River and hurt us, but we couldn't go across the river and hurt them. We're paying taxes. We think the taxes are unfair. And there's a large land tax on the big land grants that was way too high. And no postal service whatsoever. We could go weeks or months and never know what's going on back in Virginia. And it's really too far to go to court in Richmond. Uh, like I said, that's why a lot of the land claims didn't follow through. Going all the way to Richmond was just too much trouble. The balance of trade was totally unfair. We had to buy stuff from Virginia, but Virginia wasn't buying anything from us. Plus the fact we thought we should have the unrestricted use of the Mississippi River. Now this is going to be a thorn in our side for years to come because, like I said, we don't have steam and the easiest way to get anything to market is to put it on a boat, float it down the Ohio to the Mississippi and float it down the Mississippi to New Orleans and then sell it. The only other alternative is to load it up and take it across the mountains back into Virginia or go upriver. Now going upriver without any kind of power requires <laughs> manpower. You take a rope and tie it around the tree and pull your boat a little ways or you have a horse or a mule alongside the bank pulling your boat. Going upriver is not easy. We going downriver was. And we wanted to have free, unrestricted use of the Mississippi. That's called the Mississippi problem. Uh, because at the mouth of the Mississippi, there's a little town called New Orleans. And New Orleans, folks, is controlled by the Spanish. The area that's later going to be Louisiana and Texas is controlled by the Spanish. So we've got some problems. In 1784, Benjamin Logan heard that there was going to be Indian attacks. So he runs to where they're having a meeting in Danville, a very small little community, which has much more importance than the size of it. But there was a group of Kentuckians meeting in Danville. So he goes in and tells them he's heard all about this Indian attack that's going to take place. Well, it turned out it would be false. So they got to talking while he was there. It's about time Kentucky took the initiative and became her own colony, her own state. So the meeting in 1784 in Danville will be called the first Kentucky Convention and there will be a total altogether of 10 conventions over the next few years. Now we didn't have political parties per se, we had uh, people who were well, partisan I guess you call them. Uh, you had the group called the Partisans which were people who owned no land. They were late coming in and they had maybe had businesses and were successful and had money but they didn't own any land. So they thought that what we ought to do is to separate from Virginia and when we did that, take all the land that was owned and redistribute it and then join the Union. Then you had a group called the Gentry. They said, no, we're going to keep our land. We're not going to redistribute, but we do want to separate from Virginia and join the Union. Later on, the Gentry would get into arguments with themselves and, of course, split. Then you had what's called a court party, which is exactly what the name implies. It was lawyers and judges and things. They wanted to join the Union, and a few of them were non-Union. Uh, they thought maybe we ought to leave Virginia and become our own country and make our own decisions. But the Court Party was the most progressive party. They thought that Kentucky should join the Union and, and go ahead and start manufacturing. But the biggest question of all was, should we become independent once we separated from Virginia and become an ally of Spain? After all, she controlled that beautiful mouth of the Mississippi. Enter a man named James Wilkinson. Oh, he is a piece of work. I don't know, maybe it's because I know so much about him that uh, I just look at his picture and I can see his beady eyes. He was a general during the Revolution and <laughs> he was, well, he couldn't get along with anybody. He fought with Washington. He fought with General Gates. He even fought with Benedict Arnold. I mean, he couldn't get along with anybody. But after the war, he comes to Kentucky. He had, uh, shall we say, champagne taste and a beer budget. And he was having financial problems, so he decided to go west to make his fortune. And he comes to Lexington and opens a store. And he gets involved in this movement for statehood. He has a way about him. He uh, is very glib of tongue, and it didn't take him long to make friends because he was entertaining very lavishly, and he talked beautifully, he dressed well, he knew the right people. Uh, he was very well sought after. Well, after he gets involved in this statehood movement, he decides to go to New Orleans. He makes a trip down to New Orleans. 
a lot of it had to do with his own financial problems. And he managed to convince the governor of New Orleans, Esteban Rodriguez Miro, that Kentucky was near separation from Virginia. And he himself could determine which direction she was going to go in. He said he could direct American immigration away from the Spanish territory, because the Spanish were afraid we were going to go down there and get their turquoise and stuff. He could prevent the invasion of Westerners into the uh, open land of what's going to later become uh, Mississippi and Texas. But he could bring Kentucky into the Spanish orbit. And what did he want for this? Well, he didn't want much. He just wanted to trade monopoly with Spain. He wanted a royal pension and a suitable rank and position if Kentucky should become associated with Spain. Well, the governor of Spain, uh, New Orleans said he couldn't make the decision on his own. He'd have to uh, go to further up the line. But he did give him some money. And he gave him money. Wilkinson left New Orleans and went to New York, bought a beautiful carriage with matched horses, came back to Kentucky in style. It was a sight that Kentuckians had never seen before. But this particular incident is called the Spanish Conspiracy. And it won't be the last time that there's talk of Kentucky leaving either Virginia or the United States and becoming her own country and becoming, uh, shall we say, into the orbit of Spain. The Spanish Conspiracy. Like I said, he received a trade monopoly. He received a Spanish royal pension. He received rank. He returned to Kentucky in style. Now, at the seventh convention, I had there taken a vote at that point in time, and he would have probably been elected governor. Uh, but he urged support, the separation and to ally with Spain if the United States didn't offer us agreeable terms. Like I say, again, Spanish conspiracy. Very, very popular guy in Kentucky. But while he was away in Spain, He'd been here a couple of years now, entertaining lavishly, and word got out that he was not paying his bills. And a lot of suspicion would fall on someone who was not honoring his financial obligations. So they begin to realize he's a lot of talk and a lot of hot air. And before things are getting too hot and heavy, and they decide that they don't like this man, he leaves Kentucky. He exits in style, with his own time, his own volition. He still has friends in the government and manages to get a commission back in the new United States military as a general and goes to the Northwest Territory, which he will show up again shortly. But right now he's out of Kentucky. But his dealings with Spain are the first hint that we have that, you know, there's a possibility Spain could become, I mean, uh, Kentucky could become her own state or her own country and decide who she wants to be friends with. The Spanish Conspiracy. So, when Virginia had written her original constitution, she knew that the area west of the mountains was going to be hard to control. So, she made provisions in her Virginia constitution for a separation of that area. And these were basically the six things that she called for. She said, you've got to, all land claims are going to be based on Virginia land laws and they're to remain the same as they were when you were a county. Okay. All residents and non-residents that come into Kentucky are to be treated fairly. And Kentucky has to assume a portion of the Revolutionary War debts that Virginia has incurred. Well, we didn't like that too much, but okay. The Ohio River is to be free for us, for all citizens of the United States. The boundaries of Kentucky to remain the same as the county of Kentucky had been. And if you follow all these, you will have a ninth convention to accept our terms and then follow it up with a tenth convention to come up with a constitution. So we held, all this was agreeable, and we held the 10th convention in Danville. And the convention, with, uh, the constitution with, we wrote was based on the Pennsylvania model combined with the United States Constitution. We didn't want to be too presumptuous, we just wanted to be fair. And, and all in all, it did turn out to be a pretty, pretty good constitution. Article 9, which was a very interesting article, uh, said you could not free slaves without the consent of the owner. And you could bring slaves into Kentucky, but you couldn't bring them in for resale. You could only bring slaves in for your own personal use. Now, this was put in at the behest of a lot of ministers who were anti-slavery. The last Article 11 provided for a convention in 1799 to alter the, conven uh, the Constitution because they realized that you know there would be some changes made over the next few years. There was a good separation of powers, one of the best ones we had. But there were some radical suggestions made. Uh, granted, they didn't get in the Constitution, but they were made. They wanted to let women vote. Can you imagine letting women who don't have the brain for that type of thing to vote? 
You're going to educate the black slaves? Oh my gosh, what's the world coming to? Women in politics? Oh, these were just, you know, totally r radical. They just, mm -mm. They also made arrangements for a census every four years because our population was doubling every time we turned around. Now, one nice thing about it, or unusual thing, was that the governor wasn't elected by popular vote. He was elected by electors. As much as the president of the United States was, you didn't vote for him. You voted for somebody to go to Philadelphia and vote for him. And there was no lieutenant governor. If their governor happens to die or get killed, then we must have a special election. But there's no point in having more officers than we need. But there was a glaring omission. There was absolutely nothing in the Constitution about public education. It seems like our legislators felt that education was for the upper class, and the upper class would have the benefit of having tutors. So we became a state on June the 1st, 1792. And part of the problem was that the United States government kept rejecting our request for admission because they said we were frontiers folks, we had slavery, uh, we were pioneers. We wore buckskins. It, there wasn't anybody intelligent enough out here to even make up a constitution, let alone institute one. And it really kind of ticked us off. But our first governor was Isaac Shelby. And the irony is that he was one of the electors elected to go to Danville to elect somebody. As a matter of fact, several of the electors elected themselves to positions of power. Now, he had lived in Maryland, North Carolina, and Virginia before he ever came to Kentucky. He was even elected to the Virginia Assembly. He fought in Lord Dunmar's War before the uh, Revolution. He worked for the Transylvania Company. He also uh, won fame in the Revolution fighting at Kings Mountain. He was elected to the Virginia Legislature but not allowed to take a seat because they discovered he didn't have, he hadn't been in Virginia long enough. But, so when he came to Kentucky with his new bride, he was politically astute. And he turned out to be not a great governor. He was a good governor, and he was the first, Isaac Shelby. He will come back again in about mm -hmm, 20 years and become governor again, but he's only going to run, be governor for one term. Now, at the first meeting of our new government, we've got a constitution, we've got people elected. They met in Lexington instead of Danville, and uh, we had to decide what to do. They elected Robert Breckinridge, a newly arrived man from Virginia, to be Speaker of the House. They organized a militia and made Benjamin Morgan... Uh, the major general of the militia. They decided they had to have money to run the government, so they placed a tax on land and slaves and livestock and a sin tax. And then lo and behold, they passed a stamp tax on papers. And that's why we fought the revolution, folks, because of all those taxes England was passing. The stamp tax was one of the biggest complaints. But now, if you'll notice that we've got things like cigarettes nowadays have that stamp across the top. The stamp tax on papers, you had to pay a tax on wills, on dice, on anything made of paper. And they decided to make Frankfurt their capital. And they used former James Wilkerson's house, now owned by another man named Andrew Holmes, as their first capital. Boonesboro did make a bid for the capital, but it wasn't sophisticated or large enough. They wanted something new and better. So we are a state, 1792. We've grown from one county in 1776 to nine by 1792, and by 42, by 1800. Our population is increasing tenfold. Slavery increases 241 percent. And the planters who own the slaves are beginning to object to this Article 9. They want it repealed. We've still got Indian problems in the Northwest Territory, which I explained is the land north of the Ohio and east of the Mississippi, the uh, area that will become states of Wisconsin and Michigan and Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. Something called the Battle of Fallen Timbers. <clears throat> General Mad Anthony Wayne was put in charge. He came up with a group of 1,500 mounted Kentuckians. And man, you've got some good shooting power there. Because by this time, Kentuckians' reputation is dead eye dicks, good shots, good fighters. Anytime there's a fight, they want Kentuckians. They met in Fort Miami, a place near Toledo, Ohio, which is way up almost into Canada. And the fight is going just great guns, and all of a sudden the British decide that they're losing. So, I mean, the uh, English decide they're, the Indians, I'm sorry. The Indians decide that they're losing, and they go to their friends, the British, at the fort, and demand to be let in, and the British wouldn't let them in. So the combination of being outnumbered by the 
American U.S. Army and all those Kentuckians and the British betraying them, the Indians are defeated and they were forced to sign the Treaty of Fort Grenville in 1795. And that, in effect, seems to end the Indian problem, at least for now. It looks good. We've signed a treaty. We've got a state. Uh, things are looking good. But we've still got problems. Slavery is becoming an issue in our state. And Article 9 is still in effect. However, violators of this article are going to be fined $300 if you bring in a slave to sell. But the back door of that is we fine you $300, but we don't take the slave. Now, at this point in history, slaves were selling in Kentucky for around $900,000. So you could use that $300 fine as just the cost of doing business. It was not stopping it. It slowed it down a little bit. It did not stop it. Meanwhile, we've got religious groups pushing for abolition totally. Now, as I said, we didn't have political parties in the beginning. We had partisan groups. But we're beginning to see political parties start to form. And it starts quite simply uh, with the new United States Constitution. The people who were for a strong federal government and pushing for a new constitution for the entire United States were called Federalists. They were led by George Washington and John Adams were for a strong federal government. The ones who were against us were called Anti-Federalists. And they were led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, and they were for a strong states government. Now, Kentuckians, they favored the anti-Federalists mainly because of Jefferson and, and Virginia. That was our home after all. And we thought that the states should have the right to make their own decisions. We shouldn't have Big Daddy looking over our shoulders. Spanish problem again. We're bringing to have Mississippi River problems. Like I said, it's the only good method for sending our crops to market. And the Spanish are controlling that New Orleans port, and they closed it. They're afraid of the Americans coming in droves into the Mississippi area. It's going to later be Mississippi, and they're just afraid of us. So they closed the port. But John Breckinridge, um, a fairly newcomer, he's only been in, in the state since 1792, he becomes chairman of a committee to force the opening. This is in the late 1780s. Well, lo and behold, there's a French Revolution going on in Europe. Uh, we won't go into it too much, but basically, you know, the uh, French government was about bankrupt from helping us fight the uh, Revolutionary War. And 97% of the land and everything was owned by the nobility or the religious orders. And they didn't pay any taxes. So it was the poor man who paid the taxes. And the peasants were just so poor, it was ridiculous. They couldn't even afford to buy bread. So there's a revolution. It starts out, and everybody's for it. We're going to overthrow another king. We're going to have, you know, liberty for all. And most of people, the anti federalists led by Thomas Jefferson, are for it. Unfortunately, the French Revolution starts getting a little ugh, bloody. They bring out Madame Guillotine, and they start executing people. But the Anti-Federalists, led by Thomas Jefferson, did not believe it. It was vicious rumors. All it was was people over there trying to fight for their liberty. George Washington immediately declared neutrality. We're not going to get involved. Even though the France people trying to get us involved in their fight, they helped us. We should help them. And George said, no, we're a new country. We don't have the money, the wherewithal, the military. Let's just declare neutrality. Besides which, the revolution has gotten a little bit too violent. We didn't do that here. Meanwhile, a man called Guinea, a Frenchman, comes to this country to try to get help. Well, Thomas Jefferson took one look at him, and, uh, well, in all honesty, the man was dressed like a dandy. He had high heel boots, tight pants, a flowery, lacy shirt. He was wearing long hair and a big hat and rouge on his cheeks and lipstick. It just happened to be the style of dress at the court at that time. Well, excuse me, they didn't have the court, but at the upper class at that time. This was during the time when women had their hair piled high on their heads and showed way too much cleavage. Uh, President Washington refused to see him. Even Thomas Jefferson, if you took one look at him, refused to see him. But you see what has happened is that um, the French wanted New Orleans back. And they figured the only way to get New Orleans back is to sail it forward us to fighting men down the Mississippi and take New Orleans from the Spanish because with the French Revolution, not only did they overthrow the government, they overthrow their religion. 
Now, France had always been a very Catholic country and allied with Spain. Well, since they had they've gotten rid of, they're, they're even executing abbots and, and priests and, and kings and queens. They're executing anybody that disagrees with them. So Spain has kind of pulled back away. You know, you just don't do that. So the people in France want New Orleans when nobody will see. So he hears about this great general called George Rogers Clark in Kentucky. And Monsieur Gaudier approaches George Rogers Clark and offers him a commission in the French army and payment if he will go down the Mississippi with a group of men and take New Orleans for France. Well, by this time, George Rogers Clark is pretty upset with their own government because they, you know, they gave him permission to retire. Uh, they did not pay him back for all the money he paid out of his own pocket to pay his men. Uh, his enemies are not being nice at all. He's broke, and he considers it. Well, George Washington, our beloved president, hears about the possibility of General Rogers Clark, George Rogers Clark getting up a force and going down the Mississippi. And what's that going to do? If he does that, it's going to be a war with Spain. Because Spain's not going to sit by idly and let a group of people come in and take her town. So he sends word to the governor of Kentucky, forbidding him from doing this. And, of course, we're a brand new state, and our governor is a little bit perturbed with Washington because uh, the new governor is not paying any attention to Kentucky right now. So, <laughs> I, I can, um, I've seen the letter. I don't have to have a copy of it, but our beloved governor, Isaac Shelby, sent a letter back to President Washington saying, my dear Mr. President, I'm paraphrasing, of course. In case you have forgotten, Kentucky is a state. And as a state, we have a constitution. And our constitution guarantees our citizen, citizens freedom of movement. So if we have a citizen of Kentucky who wants to leave the state and take their personal possessions with them, i.e. a gun, they are free to go. In other words, I can't stop Clark from leaving the state. And he sent this to Washington. And it's been reported that when Washington got the letter, he exploded. His language was hot enough that he blistered the paint off the walls. And for a while, he was threatening to get up a group of military and come to Kentucky and take over Frankfurt. Meanwhile, the governor did go to Clark and said, bad idea, very bad idea. We do not want a war with Spain. Bad idea. So he didn't do it. So what happened to Monsieur Gonet? Well, he couldn't go back to France because if he went back to France, he'd have to report his mission was a failure. And what happened to people who displeased the government of France? Off with their heads. So he went to Pennsylvania. He found him a little fat German girl. He washed his face, took off his high heels, became a Pennsylvania farmer, and married the little German girl and stayed in this country the rest of his life. Will there be any questions on that on the test? No, of course not. It's just a side note story. In 1796, we had our first disputed election. Of course, the first one where Selby was elected, there was no dispute. But now we begin our long trail of problems in politics. It also indicated in 1796 that we desperately needed some constitutional changes. This use of electors was being objected to by the people. And they thought that the court system was being hostile to our ordinary citizens. And they desperately wanted Article 9 repealed. They wanted ministers to be excluded from the General Assembly because they're too anti-slavery. And Breckenridge led an anti-revisionist movement. He says, no, let's leave the Constitution alone. But he's going to lose. So in 1799, we have a constitutional convention. Article 9 is reinstated. Failure to pass any future halt of slaves. And the ministers wanted you to stop the importation of slaves, but we didn't get that done. The suffrage requirements were clarified. Any black, any mulattoes, and Indians could definitely not vote. Electors were discarded for the governor. Now the people of Kentucky will publicly elect the governor. The ballot vote was discarded, and to give everybody a chance to vote, even if they couldn't read or write, a voice vote was instituted, which has the advantage of letting everybody vote, but it also has the advantage of losing your privacy or your secret vote, because you've got to tell someone what you're voting for. And what happens if you tell the sheriff or the guy in charge of taking the votes, and he doesn't like who you're voting for? Does he change the vote? You can't read or write. How do you know? Uh, you also might, he might be a friend of your employer, and he kind of frowns at you when you say who you're going to vote for, so you change your vote. So the ability to sway the voter was really heavy at that. 
in June of 1st of 1800, the new constitution took effect, but we used the date of August of 1799 when it was actually voted on. Changes were approved by the members of the convention, not by 